So in um, um, thinking about this morning, um, everybody's seen The Princess Bride, right? <laughs> Yesterday, that no, some people have not. I, I love The Princess Bride. I think it's just one of the most hysterical films in the planet. Um, and uh, there's, you know, Fazzini that just constantly inconceivable. And um, when they cut the rope, and, uh, you know, the Dread Pirate Roberts still clinging onto the rocks, and Fazzini says, inconceivable. And that's when my favorite line is you keep using that word. I do not think that means what you think it means. And um, that's my favorite line in the whole film. But that's also how I felt for about the past 10 years or so when it comes to church words. Because uh, probably more like 20 years for worship. But, you know, to learn that worship is not singing, that worship is every day and every way giving myself in glory to God. You know, that, that worship can be... I, I can worship driving down the highway without a single note of music playing. Um, worship is, um, like, yeah, every day, every way. Um, concept like the gospel. That's probably more like the past 10 years. The gospel for me was always, I'm a sinner, Jesus saves. And then I learned this bigger, grander story of, that we've talked about before, of creation, fall, redemption, recreation. And how does the gospel, how does the good news of Jesus Christ being alive play into that whole recreation thing as I live out my life. And today's word, we're just barely going to begin, um, just barely introducing it, but it's repentance. And it means something that I don't think I ever knew that it meant. Um, because I grew up with a, a couple of different ideas of repentance, and see if you aren't tracking with me here. There was the, um, the kind of sandwich board guy with repent painted in black and kind of scrawled and kind of the screamy shouty turn or burn kind of guy that was just you know repent right i'm not going to try to imitate such but uh so there was that kind of idea and then there was kind of a uh, i'm going to call it a hyped up <coughs> revival repentance that was like any time a church had a revival, they brought in a speaker, there would be at least one night where he was just totally, totally engaged and it was a very emotional experience and the altar was flooded with all these people that were crying and whatever else. Meanwhile, the rest of the people are going, I wonder what they're doing. So it was kind of like a shameful, but yet expected repentance. Uh, there was a, a revival of repentance. And then probably most commonly what I grew up with was um, repentance means change of mind or change of direction. Greek, metanoia, change mind. So you put it together and it means a change of mind. And I still remember for the wrong reasons uh, when I was a youth and we were taught this prayer. Every time you do something wrong, here's what you pray. This is repentance. It was wrong, I'm sorry, I don't want it, and I'll never, ever do it again. And so if you can imagine a group of, I don't know, 20 or 30 of us in a room, junior high age kind of kids, and the preacher is literally having us repeat that, so it comes out very sing-songy, and we're all saying, it was wrong, I'm sorry, I don't want it, and I'll never, ever do it again. And then tomorrow, guess what? We did it again. It, that kind of repentance, that kind of about face kind of repentance, to me just leads to a very disorienting life. Because if, if I'm walking along doing fine and I run into something that I shouldn't have done and it means that I have to turn around and go back the other direction, but you understand what I'm saying? It's just that the image doesn't fit for me. It's very disorienting, very kind of spinny. And um, so I've been trying to figure out, okay, but... And I know some things about repentance that I've done before, but I'm trying to figure out still uh, like a picture that would be really helpful. But what we're going to do is, um, um, especially as we consider the birth of the church, and especially because it is necessary for true salvation, it is essential that we understand what repentance actually is. So if you're in Acts 2 is where we've been, um, it says this. We looked at it last week. 
Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, as we talked about last time, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. And when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And again, we said that's, that's so King James, it was far more desperate than that. And we'll see that in a minute from the Luke passage. Um, verse 38, here's the answer. Peter replied, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is for you and your children and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And with many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, save yourselves from this corrupt generation. And those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. It should sound familiar because that's, that's the beginning of Acts, right? Listen to the beginning of Luke, um, which is what uh, um, Scott was gonna read. He, John the Baptist, went into all the country around Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. It's the exact same phrase that Peter uses. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough ways smooth, and all people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. <clears throat> that right there is our evidence that repentance is ongoing. One of many evidences that repentance is ongoing. Keep producing fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not begin to say for yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of the stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The ax is already at the root of the trees. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. Same question, same desperation, same, oh my goodness, this is um, altering. This thing that you're telling us about God, about Christ, this thing that you're telling us about my sin is altering. It's, it's, it's transformative. <clears throat> and so that's what I want to get to. Again, just barely introducing it today. Um, but I hope that what, you can, what we can agree to, and maybe and, you know, I'm just going to show it to you, is that repentance comes down to changing. It does. It truly is a change of mind. It truly is a change of heart, direction, all of that. But it comes down to changing, or maybe a better word would be returning, to two truths. What do you trust about God, and what are you going to do with your sin? That's the list. You see it um, in that Acts passage. Um, just to review, this, this God in the flesh man walking among you, walking, working miracles, this one born to be killed, <clears throat> then raised from the dead to life, to the right hand of God, this Messiah that you crucified is Lord. So what am I going to believe about this Lord? What am I going to trust about God? You crucified him, what are you going to do with your sin? It really is an ego Montoya all over again. Because what happens is that we recognize as we go through life, there are all kinds of places in our life where, okay, this is a first necessary repentance, is the about face. That is when we come to recognize, oh wait, God really is sovereign. God really is Lord. God really did send Jesus. God really does love me. God really did provide for forgiveness of my sins. God is who he says he is. I put my faith in that. I turn from my sin, I turn to God. That's a one-time, first-time repentance. But what about the ongoing? What about all of these other areas of our lives that as we live, we recognize, oh wait, that's not under God's sovereignty. That's not under God's lordship. That, I'm, I'm messing up right there. I'm not doing what I should be there. I am doing what I shouldn't be right there. 
What about those? It's the same, but it's kind of different, and that's where I'm really, really struggling. I'm just being honest with you. I haven't got this quite nailed down. But I do know <coughs> that it comes back to those questions, because that's what you see all over in Scripture. What are you going to do? What are you going to trust about God? What do I do with my sin? What do I do with my sin? Quite often what we do with our sin is we hide it. Quite often what we do with our sin is minimize it. It's not that big a deal. Quite often what we do with our sin is um, kind of, don't think about it. Push it off to the side, doesn't really there. Just kind of ignore it. But we know, right? But what do we do with our sin? Scripturally, we take it back. We return to Christ. This was one of the most important things that I have learned about repentance in the past 10 years. He doesn't get tired of you coming back to him. That was amazing to me. As somebody who just keeps messing up, keeps messing up, keeps messing up, keeps messing up in the same area, doing the same stupid stuff over and over and over again. There was some part of me that felt like every time I asked for forgiveness, there was some part of God that was going, again, dude, figure it out. I'm getting tired of you. There was some part of me that figured that, that, that Jesus was looking at God and saying, one more time, give, give one more chance. And when I applied the gospel and I realized that, no, that's not how this works. How could it ever be wrong to go back to Christ and just say, I did, I, I am a mess, and, and I am sorry, and I do feel some shame for it, and I do feel guilt. I don't even feel enough guilt. That's the other thing about repentance is um, when we've got this definition that kind of makes us all disoriented, it, it also like, it creates these questions of like, okay, am I sorry enough this time? Have I repented hard enough? But that doesn't matter because what we're doing is we're putting our faith in our repentance versus our faith in Christ. So when I go back to him and I say, yeah, I, I did it again, I am so sorry. What I find is absolute forgiveness all over again. How can it be wrong to go back to him? What, what else are you going to do with your sin? What, what else do we do with our sin? Like I said, we minimize it. We talk to somebody else about it. We um, have a thousand different things that we can do with our sin that are no help whatsoever. Why on earth do we ignore or, 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 or feel shame for doing the one thing that actually is effective and works and we're called to do, which is to bring it right back to him? What are you going to do with your sin? And what are you going to trust about God? Are you going to trust that, that, kind of, that, that lie about God that says he's um, um, you know, he, he's this? He's, like I said, dude, pull it together. I, I have forgiven you so many times. I, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do with you. Are you going to trust that? That's a lie. Or are you going to return to the idea of God as, I have forgiven you. This sin that you're so wrapped up in right now and you're so upset by has already been forgiven, along with the thousands of ones that you don't even know about yet. <laughs> along with all the weird attitudes and, and things that are going on internally that you don't even know about. It's all covered. And that does not ever give us the right to be flippant about our sin. That in itself should actually make us believe even more in grace. That in itself, I mean, we should actually be just amazed that he would do these things for us. What do I do? He says, Peter, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. The name of Jesus Christ. What are we going to believe about God? Are we going to believe a lie about God, or are we going to believe the truth about God? 
Are we going to return to the truth about God? Forgiveness of your sins. What do I do about my sin? Do I bring it to him or do I carry it someplace else? You, you see the same in Jesus. Uh, Matthew 3, 1 says, In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of God is come near. After testing in the wilderness by Satan, <clears throat> from that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Do you know what a kingdom is? Who's in charge in a kingdom? King. King. This is easy. <clears throat> so, uh, if I fail the king, what are my options? I've got to go back to the king. What am I going to believe about the king? What am I going to do with my sin? What do I trust about God? What do I do about my sin? It's over and over and over again. Those are the two main components of repentance. Returning your mind and your heart to the truth of who God is, <clears throat> which is ongoing, and returning your heart and your mind to the truth of what we do with our sin. <clears throat> so I've been working, like I said, on, on trying to figure out a, a picture, and I don't have one yet. I know that this about-face thing isn't it. But I know that about face is necessary sometimes. I know that, um, just for example, uh, there was a couple, a family in LaGrange, and they became very convicted by scripture, um, by teaching from multiple, multiple sources that their finances were way out of whack in terms of uh, submitting to Christ. Uh, they weren't tithing, they weren't saving, they were spending beyond their means. All of these principles that are scriptural, they were just blowing them all away and not doing any of them. That's an about face. But yet, as they began to do that, there were these little course adjustments where they realized, oh wait, I'm not doing that, I'm not doing that. And they just kept returning to, okay, this is what's true, this is scriptural. So I, 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 I don't have that picture quite yet. Um, kind of an ongoing course correction, maybe. But I'm still working with that. Um, but that's where we'll be for a little while. Is that, because it's so critical, it's so important to understand what this repentance thing is. In Acts 4.19, is such a precious promise. It says, repent and return. That's why I keep using the word return. The times of refreshing may come from the Lord. So it, it can't be that shameful going before everybody and crying at an altar and then getting up and doing the same thing the next day. It can't be that. It has to be something that when we do it, it actually brings relief and joy, actually. Joy is the end of true repentance. That's in the Psalms. It can't be what we've made it out to be. Inigo Montoya has got to, you know, we've got to figure out what it actually is. So that's what we're going to do. Um, we're going to look at um, parts of Acts. Uh, Peter. Uh, all full of the Holy Spirit, and then gets all racist on us. Um, we're going to look at Saul becoming Paul. We're going to look at Daniel 9. I'm not sure where all we're going, but we're going to try and nail down um, repentance as a gift. Repentance as something that we have the privilege and the power to be able to do anytime, any day, every time we feel the least bit convicted to, um, to stay in lockstep with our Savior. Both work together in the Lord's Supper. What do we trust about God? What are we going to do with our sin? Both work together in the Lord's Supper. Because on the night that he was betrayed, as you know, I don't have my Bible in front of me, so I'm just going to see if I can remember this. On the night that he was betrayed, he took bread. And he gave it to his disciples, and he said, this is my body. It's given for you. At that moment, they have to choose to believe and trust this is who he is. Judas is in that room. 
Judas is not trusting the truth about God. Judas is believing a lie about God. The rest of them are in the midst of repentance because they are trusting this is who he is. What are we going to do with our sin? Jesus takes the cup, he passes it around, he says, this is the blood, this is my new covenant, this is for the forgiveness of sins. In fact, he says many sins in some of them, translations. What do we do with our sin? We give it to him. And, and we receive that through the cup. Judas is in that room. Judas didn't believe that. What was Judas doing with his sin? Ignoring it. What were the disciples doing with their sin? Taking that cup by faith and trusting that Jesus is who he says he is and that forgiveness is really offered right there, right there. So Father, I pray and ask that we could experience that today. And God, I ask that this truly is like a, I feel like this is a group project over the next weeks. This repentance as a gift this repentance as uh, a lifestyle where necessary. Um, so I just ask that you would give us light, wisdom. It's so critical to the beginning of the church. It's so critical to continuing as a church. It's so beautiful when we see in scripture evidences of like hardened, hardened kings in the Old Testament who then repent. And times of refreshing come to them and times of refreshing come to the nation. Oh my Lord, we pray for repentance from our leaders. We pray for repentance from our Supreme Court justices and our president and our vice president and our Congress people and uh, all down the line to school boards and the moms and dads in homes and to rebellious teenagers. Oh my God, we pray for a repentant, humble spirit to overwhelm your people. Let us walk in line with who you have revealed yourself to be. Yes. Please let's stop making stuff up and calling it you. As we gather, um, we're going to sing as the Elements are being passed. And we're going to sing about your truth. We're going to remember who you are. And I just ask that that would embed itself in us strongly. That the words of the song and the creed of the song would live in us through the week. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen.